It's currently excessively cold. Uh, should have put mittens on. Uh, we're going to talk about charging electric cars. Most electric cars, including this Leaf, uh, have essentially two ways of charging the car. The first is an AC connector. So this connector is called the J1772. Uh, it, well, you can see it has three big contacts, so that's uh, the AC line, AC neutral, and ground, or these may be switched. And then it has two more connectors. Uh, it has a control pilot and a proximity pilot. As you may be able to understand, the proximity pilot is just a signal that uh, it gets shorted with a resistor to ground, I guess, to signify that the uh, charger has been plugged in so that there is something in the socket. And the control pilot actually controls the uh, power flow, so how much current can flow. This particular socket, the J1772, only supports single-phase power, um, and uh, in my case, it only supports up to 16 amps, so that's about 3.3 kilowatts. Uh, the socket has been rated for up to, I think, 50. So with an appropriate onboard charger, because obviously this is AC power, so uh, it doesn't match the battery voltage, so there has to be some power conversion, you can charge with up to about 10 kilowatts through a connector like this. Now the other connector, in the case of uh, my car, this is a Chatamo connector. Uh, this is a DC charging uh, connector, and as you can see, these are very, very beefy contacts. This is actually rated for much higher currents, up to 200 amps um, at 400 volts. In the case of my car, um, it can charge with up to 43 uh, kilowatts, so that's significantly more than the AC charging standard. Most DC chargers have protocols that connect the charging pins, so these two DC pins, directly to the battery. Uh, so there's no need for DC to DC conversion, that all happens at the charger side. Uh, so it's very simple inside for the, uh, for the car itself. This does mean it has a lot more communication contacts, it actually uses a CAN bus to uh, identify itself, and it also has some analog signals. Not 100% sure uh, exactly which ones. Now, of course, uh, life would be easy if there were only two charging standards, one for AC and one for DC. But of course, uh, it's not that easy. Of course, life would be way too easy uh, if we just had one charging standard. Uh, so, there are more connectors. Uh, this cable is a public charging cable and on one end is pretty much the universal AC connector. This is what's called a Manicus connector. Um, it is completely interoperable with the J7072. It has the control pilot and the proximity pilot signal uh, and it has five line connections. So it has uh, line one, two, three, uh, neutral and ground. So this works exactly the same as the J7072, it's just a direct pass-through cable. The other side of this cable is, in fact, a J7072. And you can charge at any AC station. Of course, more phases and a slightly higher current rating mean that if your car supports it, uh, you're able to charge faster, up to 22 kilowatts. Now, the last one is, of course, our standard uh, AC plug outlet in Europe, which is called Chuko, and it's connected to this giant brick. And this brick is what's colloquially known as a granny charger or uh, otherwise portable EVSE, portable EV charger. This has on the other side of it again a J7072. And this brick, even though it's pretty big and like more than a kilo, uh, like two, three pounds. Uh, the only thing this really uh, contains is a couple of uh, relays and a tiny microcontroller that does almost nothing. It signals the car that it's ready to charge and that kind of stuff. It's uh, very simple inside, but yeah, for some reason they thought it was necessary to make it really big and heavy. And that's also the reason I'm changing this, because 
If you look at my boot, it's pretty full, and those cables are actually pretty heavy. And it would be nice to make that smaller and lighter. So fast forward a couple of days, and I finally got this in. Uh, this is a uh, just like a factory standard J7072 connector. It's even got the little rubber cap. Uh, it's a regular J7072. Uh, looks pretty good quality. I got it from AliExpress. And uh, I have an idea with this connector. So this is the connector on the inside. And it's quite obvious that there's a lot of just space inside this connector. I cannot imagine you actually needing all that space to just route the cable in here. Although, I guess if you have like a 40 amp or 48 amp, like the maximum spec of this connector uh, cable coming through, then it's gonna be pretty thick. But uh, I thought it's probably a good idea to try and put all the control electronics inside this connector. So to that end, I made this. <laughs> uh, it's actually a couple of weeks later again. Um, this is a bit of control electronics that I designed to be fully J7072 compatible and it should fit roughly. I'll just take out the switch. Yeah, sorry, I have to do it one handed. Yeah. Ta-da! Uh, it should fit like that. And uh, I will just quickly go over exactly why this is J7072 compliant. So exactly what do you need for a, an EVSE, an electric vehicle supply electronics, supply equipment, something like that. The thing is, uh, these AC connectors, these J7072 uh, connections, so that plug, as I said at the beginning of this video, it's just a um, line neutral ground and uh, two signal connections. One of the signal connections is the proximity pilot. And that connection, all it does is notify the car that there is a plug installed and that there's probably something inside the charge socket that will allow the car to charge. It's uh, fully passive, it's just a resistor to ground. So there's like no intelligence there. The only actual intelligent signal that's going on is the control pilot. So this connection has a couple of states. It's called status A through F. Uh, and it goes through like status A means uh, there is nothing detected. No vehicle is detected. Uh, status B, C and D have to do with different charging states. And then status F is an error state. So this is the control pilot. And the way that the EPSC actually knows in which state it is is it puts a 12 volt signal through a one kilo ohm resistor um, onto the car, onto, well, onto the control pilot. And the car then puts a resistor to ground on the control pilot, which drops the voltage on this wire. So it's 12 volts, it goes through 1K, it then goes in the car to another resistor, forms a resistive divider, and then uh, there is uh, either zero, three, six, or nine volts on that uh, CP connection. And then obviously, well, uh, if there's 12 volts, it's in state A. If there's nine volts, it's in state B. If there's six volts, it's in state C, etc. So far, so good. Now there's another slight complication to all of this. And that is that in state B, C, and D, it's not actually putting 12 volts continuous on this uh, control pilot. It is generating a square wave and a square wave with a frequency of one kilohertz. The duty cycle of that square wave is actually a signal from the EVSC to the car about how much current the car can draw. So what this thing needs to do, and the nice thing about being able to freely program this, you can vary this square wave to indicate different uh, charging currents. And the car will actually dynamically adjust its charging rate based on this uh, this square wave duty cycle. So a couple other projects uh, use this to do, for instance, dynamic switching. So they uh, check how much current your house is currently using. And then uh, if uh, this exceeds your fuse rating, then it uh, reduces the duty cycle on this wire and makes that your car charges more slowly. Now, in my case, I don't need those smarts. I just want to charge at 16 amps, ideally. And that's it. So 
and just have a, a fixed uh, define in my uh, code that says well just put it at something like 26 um, percent duty cycle so that's 16 amps in order to be j7072 compliant you need to do a couple of other things and uh, when the uh, EVSC is like unplugged from the car, it needs to turn off the AC wires. So uh, that's why there are two relays here, one for each pole, one for live, one for neutral. The earth is always hard connected. And uh, these are only switched when there is a car present, pretty much. Now the second thing is um, a GFI. So the EVSC needs to check if there is excessive earth current and shut off the EVSC and go into a fault state, refuse to charge um, when there is more than 20 milliamps of uh, earth leakage current. So that's what this current transformer is for, both the live and neutral go through here. Uh, if everything's okay, then obviously there in the combined current of um, those wires, so there will be current going that way through the one wire and that way through the other. That cancels out and there is no voltage on the uh, output of this current transformer. And if there is a mismatch, so if some of the current is not going back through the neutral but it's going back through the earth, then it will uh, switch off due to uh, the signal that's generated on this current transformer. And really that is mostly it. Um, of course, I do need to use a uh, Transformer, I cannot use a switched power supply that will generate some earth current. That's not good. So uh, had to use a block transformer. And this was really hard to put in. And then the other like big design problem is relays are really big and capacitors are really big. And this is a puny, puny transformer. This is a 0 0.35 watt transformer. So this can actually not supply enough current to switch both of these relays. Uh, I use latching relays, so I only have to supply a pulse of 30 milliseconds to guarantee that these are switched. But even then, uh, I basically need to charge this and on the other side of the print, uh, this um, capacitor. These two, uh, they are combined 4,400 microfarads. And that's enough to reliably switch these um, relays. Actually, I did some calculations. I did it at uh, end of life. So if these capacitors have degraded by 60%, then uh, these relays can still be reliably switched. So uh, it's a bit of a, a safety design as well. Oh, and before I forget, um, the switch, this gets actuated by the, uh, like the physical latch. Uh, this is just on the proximity pilot. This is not actually actively monitored by the microcontroller on here. This is just... Uh, just a switch that switches some resistors so the car knows whether you are busy unplugging it and can shut off the current. So it's another safety feature, but it's inherent in the plug. So yeah, I uh, just finished programming this. Uh, I will show you exactly how it works and then we can put it in the connector, glue it inside, make all the connections and try it out on the car. All right, so here's everything um, hooked up. I attach my oscilloscope, uh, that's for later, just to show you uh, the waveform that's being generated. Um, and I've put in already uh, a resistor, this is a uh, through-hole resistor, uh, from Earth, uh, which I will touch to this probe in a second. When the EVSE is first plugged in, you will hear a click. That's the uh, relays being forced off uh, because these are latching relays, you have to actively turn them off and turn them on. Uh, this is just a safety feature so that there is no AC on the output uh, just as the uh, uh, thing is powered up. So I'll show you that. Hmm. It was a very faint click, but a click nonetheless. So if I touch this resistor, it will turn on the green LED but not turn on the relays. Uh, so the LED is now on, so it's in state B. Relays have not switched. And it's now generating a PWM signal on the control pilot. And I'll attempt to show you that. Uh, there you go. 
There is a uh, one kilohertz PWM signal. It's not very very visible, but if I now remove the connections, it goes back to a positive 12 volts, and you can see the amplitude is actually a bit larger. If I touch the resistor, the amplitude becomes smaller, it becomes about 9 volts. Now, if I switch this resistor for an 880 ohm resistor, this is what the car would put here to signify that it wants to start charging. And you will uh, be able to see the green LED blink and you will hear the relays uh, turn on. So there we go. It is now in charging mode and supplying power to the car, theoretically at least. Now, if the car wants to signify a fault, it will hard short the control pilot to ground and uh, you should be able to see the red LED go on. There we go. So this is a car fault. And unfortunately, uh, I'm not able to show you what a GFI fault would be. Uh, we need some kind of controlled current source here. I did that before with my uh, transformer, but uh, yeah, it's a bit of a hassle. So if there's more than 20 milliamps of net current uh, through this transformer, then it will also turn off and latch off. The red LED will turn on uh, fully instead of bl blinking. Now I need to mention uh, one last thing about J7072 compliance, and that is this will technically not be J7072 compliant. And the reason for that is that uh, I'm putting all the electronics in the plug. And this would be fine were it not for one stipulation in the rules that says the uh, distance between the EVSC, so this, this electronics, and the plug connecting it to mains may not be more than 30 centimeters. And I'm going to put a 5 meter cable on here. So yeah, I don't know why that rule exists, to be honest, but uh, that in itself uh, makes this non-compliant unfortunately yeah so as i thought it's a little bit of a struggle to get everything in but i think it will fit uh i decided to uh remove the red led and uh just put in the green one on little little dangly wire uh just for now uh i think like this hole that's here is not quite large enough so yeah <laughs> it's a bit of a struggle Well, it's together. It's actually fully together. Uh, no wide seams or anything. Uh, all I need to do is put the Shuko on. So I'm planning to put on this IP68 one so I can use it in my charging pit. Uh, and then we should probably test it. All right, the car is still full, so I'm not sure if it will accept a charge, but at least we'll be able to see if it throws an error. So yeah, here goes nothing. <laughs> it actually charges. Oh, and then it stopped. Well, seemed to work. So I actually uh, found an excuse to drive the car around for a bit and drain the battery somewhat so I could uh, test the new EVSC. Uh, unfortunately, during the driving process, uh, some people took our spot near the charging pit, so I have to use an extension cord, but no worry. The car is indeed charging. Oh, there we go. The car is indeed charging. Uh, it works! <laughs> and to prove that it's not just the portable EVSE that I changed, uh, it is actually charging at 3.6 kilowatts so this is the uh, maximum charging rate and as you might know the portable EVSC by Nissan only charges at 10 amps so at 2.3 kilowatts or something so here's the epilogue of this video of course you want to know uh, how is it functioning and what did it cost me to make this I guess 
and of course some other stats on the uh, on the charger. So I have been charging the car for uh, two full charges now. So it has been plugged in for no, actually three full chargers has been plugged in for uh, pretty much 24 hours. So I think I can vouch for the reliability of the um, of the new charging cable, and it has been holding up just fine. Uh, I think I will insert some uh, thermal images right now. It's really like to the touch. It's not warm at all. And inside the car, it's pretty much the same uh, thing. You're looking at the car from behind now. So the uh, the pack underneath. Well, yeah. The only thing that even gets mildly warm are the contactors, and yeah, that's like nothing. So as to cost, the uh, connector was by far the most expensive thing. Uh, it was about 50 euros on AliExpress, like 62 dollars. After that, it's the the electronics inside. So uh, I paid about I paid like five bucks for the board and about 22, 23 bucks for the components. Uh, the cable is a fairly high quality uh, rubber, so natural rubber cable. Um, with three times 2.5 millimeters squared uh, conductor, so that's good enough for 16 amps. Uh, that cost me about 12 bucks, and then of course the the IP68 Shuko connector. So this is actually pressure water tight. Uh, that was another 12 bucks. So in all. I would say this cost me just over a hundred euros. So of course the next question is, is that viable? Well, to be honest, a uh, hundred euros just in cost means that if I were ever to like mass produce this and sell this, I would probably have to charge about 200 euros. And that is not that much less uh, than lots of other uh, portable EVSEs on uh, on the market. So I don't think this is actually market viable. But if there is any interest in this, uh, do let me know. Oh, and of course, I forgot one of the most important concerns that people had while I was uh, piloting this idea on a couple forums, and that is this connector is not watertight. So the um, electronics. If I were to produce this, um, would have to be completely potted. Uh, right now, I just put conformal coating on everything, like a couple layers, and that is generally good enough to avoid any issues. But for like a proper production thing, it would definitely have to be potted, and that is an extra expense. But of course, this is what I'm doing it all for. Uh, it is so so much smaller, and of course, uh, it charges faster the difference is pretty big like this uh, the original cable is a, a pretty stiff PVC cable I don't know why they use PVC uh, I guess it's just for for like fireproofing I guess but this rubber cable is just a thousand times better it is uh, so much more uh, flexible and it's tear proof mostly uh, compared to PVC which is pretty easy to cut so yes yeah, just all around better and it's more compact and yeah, this is my new cable, it just fits in the glove box. The old one <laughs> definitely doesn't fit. Um, so yeah, that's that's mostly why I did it. Uh, it's not really that much of a cost saving, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I can charge faster and it's a more compact cable, so it's all a win. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, video, my take on miniaturizing an EVSE. And... Uh, I'll see you in the next video, I guess.